On this episode of the podcast, Todd interviews Joe Heiler of SportsRehabExpert.com. The website is a great resource for all things physical therapy, movement, strength and conditioning. Joe is also a practicing physical therapist. You can learn more about his practice at ElitePTTC.com. And again, his website is SportsRehabExpert.com. Todd Neef with South Loop Strength and Conditioning, and I am chatting today with Joe Heiler. Joe runs a site called SportsRehabExpert.com, which is an amazing archive of information with uh, a lot of interviews with a lot of luminaries in the physical therapy and strength and conditioning fields. Uh, Gray Cook, Charlie Weingroff, all these types of guys. Uh, Shirley Sarman, who actually just went to one of her courses uh, two or three weeks ago in St. Louis, which was amazing. Um, we can talk about that a bit too. But I actually first came across Joe's site Many, many, many years ago, uh, when I was trying to research what workout routine I should do in my college gym when I had never done anything fitness related in my life. And I was kind of looking at it and I was like, this seems really cool and very dense, but this seems more like it's about fixing injuries and I just don't know what I'm supposed to do for exercise. Um, so I kind of looked at it and then passed on it and then later I ended up coming back to it. Uh, I found it again through something else and uh, just just started digging in uh, when this this is when I was actually becoming a coach and I was really interested in, you know, how do, how do I get people to move better? I'm trying to coach people and I see them, you know, they I want them to keep their knees out on the squat and they just can't do that. I want them to, you know, maintain a good lumbar position. They just can't do it. So trying to dig deeper down that rabbit hole in terms of why is coaching not sufficient all the time in terms of trying to get people to do what you want them to. Uh, so Joe has all this information on there. It's super fantastic stuff. I've gone through most of the archives and then uh, listened to a lot of the older interviews as well. Um, so tons of great stuff there. And Joe also practices in, uh, in Michigan. And his clinic is called Elite Physical Therapy and Sports Performance. So um, Joe, thanks for hanging out with me today, man. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks for having me on. It should be fun. Yeah, I'm excited. And then, Joe, you actually interviewed me uh, maybe a year and a half ago for Sports Rehab Expert. So um, now that we kind of have the South Loop Strength and Conditioning podcast going, I thought it would be really cool to chat with you, especially since you're always the one kind of doing the interviewing, right? You're the one sort of saying, hey, like, let me call you up. Let me ask you these questions. You know, I'm going to give you a platform to throw your ideas out there, and I'm going to kind of try to take some knowledge from you. But, you know, I, I think it's really fascinating to say, hey, what are you actually taking from all these interviews and articles and stuff like that that you sort of – uh, posted and created over the years. Yeah, it is a little different being on the other side. And the former student of mine interviewed me this morning for his business class too. So yeah, two in the same day. It's it's a little more than I'm used to. There you go, man. You're uh, you're a celebrity. <laughs> I don't really doubt that. <laughs> fit, fit, fitness celebrity just having to line up the interviews and knock mm -hmm. them out one after another. Um, but yeah, man, I, th I think that one of the things that really is interesting to me is that, you know, I, I'm someone who... Uh, just loves to consume information, right? Like, like I mentioned before, you know, I, I went through your archives of all the, the calls you've done. I've probably listened to almost every single one on the site. Um, and I'm just like, yes, like give me more knowledge. Like, let me take this continuing education course. Let me read this article. You know, I'm going to subscribe to more podcasts than a human being can feasibly listen to and then start listening to them at two times speed just so I can like keep, um, getting more info in. Right. So it seems to me, you know, at least at some level, you're, you're sort of sucking on this fire hose of information as well. Um, more from the being an interviewer perspective. And then how do you, how do you sort of, uh, prioritize and, and decide what you actually want to, what you want to consume, who you want to interview, all that type of stuff? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one of the big things I think everybody has to, I guess, kind of figure out for themselves is what, you know, what kind of they're, they're the best at and what they really want to do the most. There's, there's so many things out there. And then just, you know, I'll talk about, you know, from a PT perspective for a moment, you can take, I mean, I could take 10 courses a year, but I'm never going to be able to really get good at any of those things if I'm trying to implement everything. You know, I think you have to have, you know, a nice, kind of base from which to work and then be able to take, you know, everybody else's stuff and maybe kind of pick and choose the things that are going to work well for what you do. Um, so you can kind of, you know, work those things and integrate it into the system that, you know, that you're already using is, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I've talked to a few friends of mine about this too. They probably take even do more courses than I even do. And sometimes it's just like they're exhausted. There's so much information. They're not sure, you know, how to best use it, um, you know, or when to use it. And that's, you know, and it just gets to be a little too much. So, I mean, I think what people need to do is just, you know, it, it's great to go out there and learn these things, but you got to figure out what works best for you and then figure out, you know, the best situation to implement, you know, these things. And that's what we try to do a lot of on the site too, is we'll interview someone, um, you know, on a, you know, talking about their system or their different techniques. And then, you know, maybe we'll come back with a case study or two, uh, or I'll try to get them to talk about a couple of case studies when they would specifically use these kinds of things. Or, um, you know, one of the systems I use the selective functional movement assessment from Greg Cook, which, you know, your readers probably know more of uh, like the functional movement screen, but this is their medical model. You know, that's kind of my base uh, for everything looking at how I look at movement and how I determine where I want to go, but I can mix other people's techniques in and, um, you know, or other people's, you know, I can take things from their system and maybe to help me work within the SFMA better yet. So it's definitely, there's an art to doing this and it's same in strength and conditioning as well. You know, there's so many different things you can do, but you have to have your go-to moves, I think. And then there's lots of ways you can tweak what you do well, you know, to fit each of your, uh, you know, each of your, clients or your athletes but yeah you just can't so much good stuff out there you gotta you gotta find something to be really good at yeah for sure and and i think that um within the the strength and conditioning sphere that's something that over time i've uh i think i've been able to do is you know rather than saying okay like should i buy should i be using a you know a polican protocol here or should i be using you know a wendler system or should i be using a west side system rather than sort of having these almost disparate boxes uh, that you pull from, you say, okay, why, uh, you know, is Charles Poliquin saying to do this and why is Louis Simmons saying to do this? And then you can integrate pieces of those to your own, uh, coaching and your own model based upon what you see as appropriate. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, it sounds like you're saying something similar and that you maybe start with an SFMA and then based upon that, you can utilize any technique that you see as appropriate for that person. Is that kind of what you're saying? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, if their goals are the same, they're going the same place. It's just sometimes they've all got different ways of getting there. And sometimes you can find, you know, ones that, you know, really work well, you know, within your other systems and integrate those things. in. so, you know, from like PT perspective, yeah. So I use the SFMA, but you know, the Postural Restoration Institute has got great stuff out there too. And PRI is getting big in strength and conditioning as well. You know, there are certain tests they use or certain, um, corrective exercises that just work beautifully within the SFMA. Um, truly Sarman, you mentioned, um, I was surprised she's still teaching. She's still teaching, um, courses. You were just that one. I mean, yeah. she's got so much great information. It's just kind of on a little bit of a smaller movement scale than looking at like big gross movement patterns like the SFMA does, but I can, I can steal all kinds of her stuff and work it into that system, you know, seamlessly. But then there's other things that, you know, maybe it just doesn't kind of go with my philosophy or how I want to do things, especially when we're with working with athletes. And, you know, so maybe I don't use that part of it, but, you know, it works. It's what works for me. It's worked in. I can do it well. So that's where I'm at with that. Yeah. And I, th I think one of the things that's challenging for a lot of people, if they start to go down, you know, different continuing education paths or learning something um, is sort of like you said, being able to pick and choose the parts that work and, you know, figure out what makes sense for you and what resonates with you without saying, you know, I have to completely reevaluate my whole system or like, I don't agree with X, Y, Z from what Shirley Sarman is saying. So I'm going to throw the whole thing out. Right. I think that that's a, that's a tough piece. So, uh, how, how do you sort of figure out what resonates with you? You know, so let, let's use, let's use Shirley as an example, since her approach is very, uh, like you mentioned, very biomechanical in nature. Right, which I think that, at least relative to my bias, I'm probably more interested in nervous system pieces, but can still, you know, appreciate. Hey, listen, like I've never looked at scapular positioning in this much detail, and I think that there's value there. So, how, how do you decide when you can pull something out and when you say, you know what, this doesn't resonate with my my model of how the world works? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, a lot of times it just depends completely on the person that's standing in front of you and what you find in your evaluation or. You know, however you screen them, you know, say in the gym as well. And, and sometimes, I mean, you just got to take like Shirley's stuff. I don't want to say it's, 
it's more simplistic or it's basic, but if you look at a lot of the moves that she teaches, it's stabilize, you know, one joint system while you're moving, you know, another adjacent to it. You know, can you stabilize one while you move the other? I mean, and a lot of people can't do something even that simple. So sometimes there's times when you need something very basic just to teach somebody how to move or how to stabilize. And, um, you know, some of the other things I've learned over the years are much more complex. And maybe it's just too much for that person to handle at that time. So I got to kind of go back in my bag and pull out something that I learned from Sharp or from um, Shirley that, you know, they seem fairly simplistic, but that's what they really needed to kind of get, get things moving better, kind of get the idea in their head, hey, this is how I want you to move. Then I can take that piece and I can start putting it into some larger movement patterns. Or you know, maybe then I can go back to, okay, now let's try um, – you know, pulling that, pulling that bar off the rack again, doing like a deadlift, you know, or an RDL, you know, now we can go back and actually try that. Maybe it might work now that they've got a, you know, a little better idea of what I'm asking them. Sure. So how do you sort of decide what you, what you want to see from someone? Cause I think that that, that's an interesting point is that, you know, you may try something and then it doesn't work and then you say, okay, I'm not getting what I want what can I do to get what I want? What, what does that process look like for you? Because I think that that's one of the most interesting aspects of coaching someone is figuring out, you know, how to decide when to change what you're doing and how to decide when, you know, you just need to stay the course and keep pushing someone to, to improve in an area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a million dollar question right there. Yeah. And a couple of things. I mean, I think it's, I like to think Charlie Weingroff's a good friend of mine. This is something he says a lot that, have the end in mind. I mean, know what your goals are, know where you want to get that person. Um, and if, you know, it's, it's a competitive athlete or, you know, he uses weightlifting examples all the time. If their goal is to deadlift 500 pounds, you know, that, that's great. We got it. But, you know, how am I going to work backwards from that goal and find a starting point for them that they can be successful with and we can start working there? And for some people, like even physical therapy background, it might just be teaching them to breathe correctly again, be able to exhale get their ribs down, get their back in a neutral position. That might be working on a deadlift for some people. Um, you know, for others, it might be pulling from a rack. You know, so it depends on that person. But what I was kind of say is the more regressions you have, you know, like how far back you can go when you've got all those options. It's, I mean, it's, it's so critical, I think, to have those regressions that you can just pull them out when you need them. Now, by the same token, though, how do you know which regressions you need? That's where I think, you know, having, you know, a system in place that helps you distinguish something, you know, like, uh, you know, mobility dysfunction versus a motor control dysfunction. I mean, that's a big thing a lot of people talk about nowadays. Um, again, I'm a big SFMA guy, functional movement systems. That's what they preach is if you is correcting mobility dysfunction before you try to go correct motor control. Um, and again, I think if you if you can find mobility problems and knock them out, a lot of these things, especially in the weight room and athletics, are going to get a heck of a lot easier. So having a way to distinguish between those two is uh, is pretty critical too. Because, uh, I mean, a great, great case in point, uh, you know, a lot of people do Pilates or they, you know, core strengthening, you know, that'll fix your back. Well, if you don't have good hip extension, as soon as you take off the walk or run, you're just going to pull into lumbar lordosis because you're, you're, you have to extend that hip somehow. If your hip doesn't move, your back's going to move. You're going to have the strongest core in the world, but you know, you got to push off when you walk or run or you're not going to go anywhere. So you're going to give up that stability to get that mobility. So that's why knowing whether or not, you know, Hey, I got a mobility problem here. I need to fix this first. Now I can come back and throw my stability or motor control fix on top of it. Um, it's critical, you know, for success. Sure. No, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, you see the, uh, um, you can have a certain movement pattern or, uh, strengthen a muscle in, in a certain setting and then it can be gone in another one. Right. And that can make a lot of, uh, exactly. a lot, yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of things confusing where it's like, well, why can I do, you know, these glute bridges, no problem when I'm laying on my back, but still when I'm running or squatting or something that, you know, my pattern is completely screwed up. Um, so I, I have a question for you that, that I've actually, uh, wondered about in my own sort of research, right? When we talk about these mobility versus stability problems, um, it seems like, you know, that, that you, you sort of mentioned the, the functional movement bias is to go after mobility first. Um, 
And if you start going down some of the rabbit holes of like the DNS and PRI folks, it seems like you can actually fix a lot of mobility problems by resetting global stability as well. Does that kind of make sense? Um, what, uh, what, what are your thoughts on figuring out, you know, is this a mobility problem that needs some sort of adjustment or manual therapy or something like that versus this is a mobility problem that is effectively the body trying to protect itself and locking itself down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's so much stuff coming out now. I think like with PRI, you're finding it and some of the other, you know, neuroscience types of things that, um, just the body being in a sympathetic state, you know, locked up, high stress, high tone. Um, there's, there's, you know, lots of different ways to get people to, and say relax seems kind of simplistic, but to get them more parasympathetic, get them to tone down and just, you'll get them moving better again, which is where a lot of the, like the, just the PRI breathing exercises or like their, their hip lift exercises. You're just putting people in positions and trying to inhibit muscles, get them breathing right. And then all of a sudden things move better. So again, I, you know, some of those drills like that, they can be multi-purpose. You know, I, I'll consider it, you know, probably a mobility drill. If I'm trying to get their hips moving better or you can even get their shoulders moving better. At the same time, I'm working on their breathing and their, you know, their diaphragm position and all this. So, I mean, it, it's kind of tricky to label it one thing or another, but I, I know what you're getting at with, with like the PRI stuff. Um, so you can change mobility, I mean, in two minutes with with some of their drills and you're not stretching, you're not going through any kind of range of motion, you're just basically inhibiting things and getting a diaphragm to work and repositioning the rib cage and pelvis and all of a sudden everything was better. Sure. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting stuff. Um and then another another question I think would be uh, interesting for you since you also, you know, you you're a physical therapist, but you also do strength training, right? So it's um mm -hmm. uh something that I see that is a challenge for me in coaching athletes is, you know, I may see an issue, you know, let, let, let's use an example within, within CrossFit, which I coach a lot of competitors in, uh, would be a muscle up, right? So basically pulling yourself from the bottom of the rings to the top of the rings. And I see a lot of issues with athletes in terms of their scapular stabilization strategy there, right? They tend to pinch excessively, which then basically causes them to get jammed up and they can't uh, effectively transition through. So they basically pinch their shoulder blades together rather than uh, tilting them anteriorly to transition through, right? So um, it's one thing to get them to understand the proper pattern, you know, on the ground, breathing, doing drills, but then let's say, okay, cool, it's time for you to perform and to do this high level movement pattern. Um, bridging that gap is extremely difficult. And that's something that I personally struggle with. Do you have any thoughts on figuring out how to get people to, you know, uh, adopt new movement strategies when they're performing at high intensity or a high percentage of, of a one rep max load for them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah. And that's where, you know, I guess, my job first and foremost is always to make sure an athlete can move well enough to do what it is he needs to do. And um, I guess an example I'll use uh, TPI. I've done some things through Titleist and, you know, you're in a, you're in a classroom with, you know, there's PTs, there's strength coaches, and then there's uh, golf coaches in there. And one of the things they stress is like, look, you PTs do what you PTs do best and get them moving well enough to be able to swing a golf club. You know, the strength coaches, you know, you get their fitness level up enough to be able to handle the game. The golf coach will teach them how to, you know, how to swing a club, which is, you know, which is great because I'm, I'm a horrible golfer and I would never teach anybody to try to, to swing a golf club. But if I can get them moving well enough, I know then I can send them to that golf coach and he's, you know, what he wants to show them, they at least have the mobility and they have the motor control to do it. Um, they may still need to put a little fitness on there too. Hopefully, you know, I've, I've bridged that gap as well. So that's always the hard part then. If, if, if I can clear their mobility, I can get the motor control there at the at that most basic level. And then it's finding ways to progress up to something like a muscle up, which is, I mean, yeah, talk about a complex pattern. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's not something I do. You know, I deal a lot more with like some of the Olympic lifts. And I mean, we're breaking them down into pieces as much as I possibly can um, to teach them appropriately. You know, same thing would probably apply for a muscle up too. Can they do a pull up the way you want them to do it? 
you know, that'd be one thing, you know, if they can't do a pull up the way you want, there's no way they're going to do, you know, the complete muscle up. So, I mean, I guess trying to, you know, first establishing they've got the mobility and stability and then working on progressions to get them to that kind of that ultimate athletic movement. Um, and that is the trick. I mean, it does take a great coach and uh, you got to know the right things to say to them. So it, you know, so it makes sense to them in their heads too, how they're going to pull that off. Sure. Hopefully that helps to answer that question. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, you, you sort of fundamentally want to clear, um, does the body have the capacity to even perform the correct movement from exactly. a mobility yeah. and motor control perspective? And then um, does the person have the requisite strength or conditioning to perform it, right? Where it's like, you know, like you mentioned, if you if you aren't just literally strong enough to do a pull-up with good scapular positioning, even if your body can create it, you know, that's it's, it's not going to work out. So you have to build that strength. And then if you have the mobility, motor control and strength, then it's a matter of learning the skill, right? And for some people, it may just be a matter of, okay, we have to clear those issues. And then we have to reteach you how to perform the skill, because even though the issues are gone, you know, you still pull out the wrong motor pattern when it's time for you to, to compete or perform. Yep. Exactly. Well, and you think too, it's interesting, you know, for uh, a while there, scapular retraction was the answer to everything, wasn't it? Oh, for sure. I mean, that, fix, that's... fix your shoulders. All you got to do is squeeze your shoulder blades together all day long. It fixes everything. It doesn't yeah. work on a muscle up. Yeah. No, <laughs> j- j- jams, jams you up pretty good on that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of things that jams you up pretty good on. But I mean, there's an example of, you know, something that was, you know, probably beneficial in some situations, but try to take it and use it for everything. And it just doesn't, you know, yeah, it's exactly. not going to work in every case. Yeah. And that, that's something I see with a lot of athletes, you know, is that um, so many of them are super extended and pinching their shoulder blades together all the time because they, you know, have been t- coached that or taught that at some point. And mm-hmm. the reality is, is for them, they're already tending towards that position based upon their activity and their lifestyle. And then they're forcing themselves even further in it, which just is, you know, it's a nightmare to try to get them out of it where, you know, if someone's, a uh, um, it, it completely faulted into flexion and rounded over or whatever, maybe it's beneficial for them to try to, you know, pull their shoulders back a little bit, but for someone who's already extended, it's just a, it's a disaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, cool. No, that, that, that's really interesting stuff just in terms of trying to figure out the, uh, the progression, right. And then the steps along the way. So I think that's a challenging piece too, is how do you find the right spot for someone that is challenging to them, uh, but doable where they can actually learn. And, you know, if you take something like you mentioned, like the Olympic lifts or, or like what I was mentioning, a, a muscle up, you know, maybe doing the full muscle up is too challenging to actually learn because you have to use too much of your strength to get it done, right? Maybe trying to do right. a full squat snatch is too challenging to learn for you because, you know, even though maybe you uh, impinge in the hip a little bit, you can kind of get around it. But once you start actually trying to jump and land that position, it, it's too much. We need to figure out where is a step along the way where you can actually hit that position without defaulting to your faulty pattern. Right. Yeah, yeah that, that's exactly right. And just, you know, good coaches, they know all those tricks, you know, one thing doesn't work. Well, again, those regressions, how can I take it back one step and let's see if they're successful here. And then, you know, they get them successful there for a while, then jump back up again and see if, you know, maybe now they can handle that, you know, the next higher step. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's, uh, I think that is a challenging piece to say, okay, I'm not getting what I want here. Can I pull you back a little bit? Um, or sort of say, okay, cool. We're not getting what we want here. Maybe we need to look at either strength or mobility or motor control and figure out if one of those is actually the limiting factor instead of what we're trying to work on now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a, that's a tricky process that, uh, you know, all, all, all the, all the flow charts in the world probably can't, Probably can't get you to do that the the right way every time, but it's cool to think about. Yeah, it's a little easier in my world because uh, I deal in pain, and you know, most or most people that are in pain. So if something doesn't go well, they hurt, and they're kind of you know, that's kind of their cue to okay, I can't quite go that far yet. So it's easy for me to say, hey, let, let's take a step back, let's make you know, let's do it this way. You know, there's no pain. Hey, look, you moved really well. Let's work on this for a while. You know, in your setting, it's a little different sometimes. Or when I'm when I got groups in here in the summer, they're just kids that don't move well, and I don't want them doing something yet. They have a hard time understanding, you know, why can't I do that exercise when you know my two buddies are over there doing it. And um, you know, it's tough to explain to a kid, you know, about think about, you know, hey, you know, this could happen, this could happen. They don't, you know, their minds don't work that way. 
Sure. They're indestructible. Sure. And then in, in that situation, how, how do you get buy-in, right? Because, I mean, you, you, you know, I think we all get the clients who think they're indestructible or, or don't want to listen or do what they do what they want to do. Um, but, you know, at some level, as a coach or a therapist, you have to create enough buy-in for someone to um, go through the process you want them to, right? It might not be perfect, mm-hmm. but you want to at least get them to say, hey, maybe I'm going to at least try what you're telling me. How, how do you create that if you get someone pushing back on you? Yeah. I think the trick sometimes, like, Sometimes I'll even let, because I tend to work with more of like the younger athletes, high school kids and all. And um, if we're doing group training sometimes, you know, I'll let the kids kind of venture into certain things and, you know, and let them see or let them feel the struggle, you know. And then if I get a chance, you know, maybe pull them back a little bit and they feel how that was so much easier. You know, the bar wasn't on your back, but we got to, you know, we're doing a goblet squat instead. And hey, look how much deeper you could go in that. Your knees didn't cave in. You know, everything looks so much better, but that felt better, right? And they're like, usually, yeah, that did feel better. Um, so again, I think you have to have, you know, be confident that, hey, I've got this next step back. You're still doing something pretty close to what your buddies are doing, but hey, it's much better doing this way, wasn't it? And, you know, just that kind of a front squat versus a back squat might be a, a case in point. They're, you know, using like a goblet squat. You know, load up a goblet squat. A lot of kids can be super successful with something like that, but you put a bar on their back and they fall apart. So they're still squatting. Um, you know, they're still using some weight. It's just not, you know, quite what their buddies are doing. But yeah, so it's it can be a trick unless you've got a good kind of fallback um, exercise to go to. Sure. Yeah. I mean, basically, you know, give them a little bit of uh, give them a little bit of leeway and free reign, and just try to create wins where you can to get to get buy-in that makes sense mm-hmm. yeah it's uh um it's it's not always easy especially when you have people with uh who are trying to compete with each other or a little bit of ego at stake and they they kind of want to not listen and and they think they that they need to go harder or do more weight or something like that rather than you know figure out how to do it right yeah um cool so let's let's actually let's start talking about um you know how how you balance your uh, your practice and sports rehab expert and all that type of stuff because I think it's really interesting um, that you you know are practicing day in day out working with uh, pain clients coaching some athletes and then also you know putting all this content out at the same time and really trying to not only learn yourself but give uh, other people in the industry this opportunity to to learn so what is what does a typical week look like for you in terms of where you spend your time how you uh, prioritize what you're doing all that type of stuff yeah that's <laughs> I probably work way too much but you know over the over the years, it's kind of changed a little bit because, you know, at first it was just me running the website for about about four years and I was working for someone else. And, you know, I just, um, you know, I'd come home at night and get some work done after my kids went to bed or I just get up early in the morning and get it done. But, you know, I kind of you know, wanted to start my own PT practice with the, uh, the idea in mind that, hey, I could have some built in time to, to really work on the website, you know, do the continuing education that I wanted. And, um, you know, that, that worked okay for about six months. And then I started getting really busy <laughs> with my PT practice. And, uh, and it kind of goes back to, hey, I'm working on the website at five in the morning or 10 o'clock at night. So <laughs> that's, so the, you know, the best laid plans, you know, they don't always work out. But, but at the same time, um, you know, we've grown to the point that we've, you know, I've got two full-time therapists and another athletic trainer that works a couple days a week. And, you know, that takes time just managing other people as well. So it's kind of a trick working it all in, but, um, we're at a point now I can take Fridays off for the most part, you know, and do things, you know, fun things like this, or I can do marketing. I can, um, you know, I can work on whatever I need from the business side of things. And I've got time to get some articles up and, you know, do a couple interviews, you know, Fridays, usually my days to get those kinds of things going. So it, uh, but you know, what, it's, I say, I say it working a lot, but you know, it's, it's so much fun doing this. I mean, I really enjoy talking to guys like you and interviewing, you know, PT, strength coaches, chiropractors, you name it. I mean, there's so much to learn. Um, it's really a blast being able to do that kind of thing. So I guess I don't look at it as, as a whole lot of work. Sure. No, that makes sense. So you kind of try to segment your days out and say, okay, cool. I'm going to, you know, see patients on these days and try to block off my schedule on this day to do more no. website type of stuff and all that. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. 
I mean, and we kind of talked about this a little bit before we started recording. I, I try to do the same thing, but, you know, inevitably on a week by week basis, it all gets screwed up and I'm like, okay, cool. You know, Fridays, I'm going to write all my program designs for the week. And then it's like, actually, we have an event this weekend. So I'm going to prepare for the event and I'm going to be doing my program design at 11.30 p.m. on Sunday, which is my least favorite activity at that time. But, you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, no. I, I, th I think we sort of all end up there. Um, no matter how much we try to plan it and set it up. But no, that, that, that's, that's interesting though, to try to, um, basically pull information in, uh, synthesize it to create content. And then you have an immediate feedback loop that you can practice in as well. Right. So you can sort of see what yeah. works, what doesn't work, all that type of stuff. Yeah. Well, um, I think that's one thing people just need to, you know, to be open to ideas and, and, and go in and just and try them out. I mean, there's been, I can't tell you how many things I was listening and I was kind of like, you know, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's going to work. And, you know, I just have that one patient like, yeah, let me try this. You know, let's, let's just see how this will go. And, you know, that's, hey, that's how you learn it. Maybe it works great. Maybe it doesn't. I never do it again, but I picked up some pretty cool things over the years that I really thought I'm like, nah, that's not going to work. And then uh, I'm like, you know, what? I'm just going to give it a try, give it a fair, give it a fair shake and see. And, uh, you know, so yeah, it's a nice to be able to, take things from the website and then just come try to put them into practice here and, and see how they work. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and when you have a sort of a tight feedback loop like that, I think it makes uh, learning go a lot more quickly as well. Um, yeah. Cause it's not, it's not all just theory and it's not all just, um, just practice. You can quickly pull from one to the other and try to try to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so with your, uh, with, with your physical therapy clients, it sounds like you do, uh, SFMA, on pretty much everyone. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I mean, if they're appropriate, there's some post-surgical things maybe that they're not, but for the most part, yeah. Just to get a nice overview of how someone moves. Cool. Mm -hmm. So you, so you kind of use that as a baseline and then, uh, start to pull in, um, other stuff potentially from there to, to start to figure out, you know, different pieces. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, and so once you sort of gone through, um, SFMA with someone, you know, do you, based upon your model, are you spending a while with people, you know, working on ankle mobility or this, that, or whatever? Do you, do you sort of have to say, okay, you know, this is your problem and we're going to focus in on that. What, what does that look like for you? Yeah. I mean, the, the interesting thing sometimes you, you take someone through, you know, the SFMA and you're looking for, you know, where in that within that model, like dysfunctional movement patterns that are not painful. And those are the, you know, those are the patterns that you're going to try to correct, which will ultimately, you know, affect their pain, make their pain go away, get them moving better, you know, help them achieve their goals. But sometimes it's pretty interesting. You get someone with, uh, you know, say, a, you know, a knee problem and, you know, a lot of their lower body movements are actually looking pretty good. Their knees got full range of motion. And, uh, you know, their hip actually moves well, but you find uh, their thoracic rotation is limited, their shoulder mobility is limited, and they've got their opposite ankle dorsiflexion stinks. And, uh, you know, again, you're trying to explain to them, well, look, here's where you don't move well. I know that your knee is what hurts, but, you know, the, the site of the pain is not always the source of the pain either. So the SFMA kind of lets you play detective a little bit and try to figure out, you know, where this, all this dysfunction is coming from that's resulting in, you know, now your knee hurts when you try to squat or you try to run. So, you know, based on what I find in that, then we're going to go to, you know, either if it's a mobility dysfunction, maybe I'm doing hands-on joint mobility work, soft tissue work, um, dry needling, grassing technique, whatever it is I think I need. And then, um, you know, from that motor control standpoint, then once I got something moving, I got to get them to, you know, put it into function and make sure that they keep that mobility. So there's, you know, you've got all your, you know, you name it, there's so many systems out there you could, you could take from, um, you know, with their exercises and, and motor control work. But, you know, again, that is the thing, like trying to get that, that buy-in so they understand. And it's not that I don't, I don't treat their pain. If there's a reason to be treating their knee manually, taping them off, uh, you know, ice, heat, whatever it is, you know, we're going to do that. But again, I'm looking long-term. I want people to get better and not be back, you know, three months later, oh, my knee hurts again. You know, I want to take care of that problem the first time. And uh, surprisingly, I mean, not surprisingly, but, you know, interestingly enough, a lot of times, you know, we'll be working distal to the site or proximal to the site of pain. And, you know, they walk out feeling a whole lot better. And I didn't have to really do a whole lot with their, with their sore knee. Sure. 
Oh, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's fascinating stuff when it kind of clicks like that. Um, so you, you mentioned, did, did you start sports rehab expert or your practice first? Which one, which came first? Um, the sports rehab expert. Yeah, it was about eight years ago now. Got it. So, so yeah. you kind of had, and you were working as a PT and you started the sports rehab expert site and then, uh, were able to say, okay, cool. I want more control over my time, more control over this. So I'm going to open my own practice so I can right. kind of be. Okay, interesting. So, um, what 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 led you to actually start the sports rehab expert site? Because I mean, that's a, you know, that's a that's a big undertaking to say, you know, what I'm mm-hmm. gonna I'm gonna put this information out there. Yeah, it was um, actually it kind of started uh, the old you know strengthcoach.com was a site that I was on quite a bit, and um, back then, I mean, Mike Boyle had just taken it over, and uh, there weren't very many PTs on that site. Uh, Charlie Weingroff and I were two of the, you know, maybe less than 10 that I could think of, um, on that site. And we were just getting hammered constantly, not, not personally against us, but just, <laughs> you know, all the coaches on there, strength coaches, um, you know, the, you know, the PTs, Kairos, you know, they're sending our athletes back and they're not even close to being ready, you know, just cause they can sit on the table and bend their knee all the way. doesn't mean they're going to stand up and be able to do a squat. And a lot of PTs, honestly, you know, they don't know, You know, they're just, if they can't, well, the squatting must be bad because you can't do it. It's hard on your knees. Just don't squat. Well, that's, that's not going to fly when you send a kid back, you know, to work with their strength coach or their football coach or whatever. They're going to have to do those things. And, uh, so, you know, I just, I guess I kind of heard the, the complaints and, uh, figured, you know, maybe we should look at doing something about this to educate more of the health professionals. But at the same time, you know, lots of, you know, there's so much, crossover between you know like what i do and like what you do you know there's no reason that we both can't be working on some of these things and so that's where we tried to bring in a lot of the strength coaches and and athletic trainers and and performance enhancement specialists people like that to really get all sides communicating and uh, get us kind of all on the same on the same page got it so so it's kind of a uh you're part of a strength coach based online community and said, you know what, there's this need for a similar piece with, you know, physical therapists, um, athletic trainers, all that type of stuff where people who have, you know, uh, uh, I guess a more integrated complex perspective can get together and start to, to share that stuff. That's cool. Right. Um, Yeah. And so then, then from there, um, when you started that site, I mean, you know, at this point, you've pretty much interviewed everyone who uh, anyone would recognize who is involved in the physical therapy community. How did you start to how do you start to piece those interviews together in terms of you know getting people to to buy in and say, hey, listen, I actually want to talk to this guy, Joe. Uh, what 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 did that process look like for you? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. Um, right about the time I was taking, uh, or I was just starting up the site. I took my first okay. SFMA SFMA course. Now you're done the functional movement screen. So at least I, you know, I, I knew Gray a little bit, got to talk to him a couple of times. And then I met all his buddies teaching the SFMA stuff. And, and it was, it just kind of all happened pretty conveniently that we we're out at athletes performance. And um, I sat down next to Charlie Weingroff, who I didn't know at the time, even though we were both, like I said, we we're on the uh, strengthcoach.com forum all the time going back and forth. And uh, Sue Falsoni's there. Uh, Nick Winkleman's there, you know, all these guys from AP that are off on their own doing things now. And, um, I just started asking like, Hey, starting this website, you know, we're going to talk about these kinds of things, bridging the gap. And which of course is what they were all into out at athletes performance and obviously Charlie and, um, you know, Gray and his guys. And it just kind of, you know, once I got some of those people on board talking about it, you know, it was kind of easy to get others to say, you know, Hey, would you mind coming on and doing this? And, you know, the interesting thing is most of the people in our profession are just, are, are fantastic people. And they, you know, they get an email from some guy like me. They have no idea who I am, what I do. And I'm just asking, Hey, you know, we do these interviews. Would you love to come on or like to come on and talk about, you know, what it is you do and, you know, people are interested in your techniques and, and 90 plus percent of the time they say, yes, it's, it's pretty rare that someone says no. And it's, it's usually then it's just because some of them are so darn busy they just don't have the time for anything else uh, in their schedule, but I mean, rarely does anybody say no. So I've been blessed um, that just, you know, I've kind of lucked out with those kinds of things and been in the right places at the right times and got to meet the right people. Um, you know, for the old perform better summits back in the day. I mean, I know they still do them. I haven't been to one in a while, but 
you go there, meet a bunch of guys, and in the next six months, I'm interviewing them all. Sure. No, that's uh, that's cool. And I, and I like that you mentioned that you know within the uh, within this type of profession, a lot of folks, especially the folks who who we're talking about, you know, I mean, I think most people um, have mentors who taught them stuff, right? They read books, they had, you know, someone who took them under their wing, who um, they took the courses from. And, and from those people, they, they learned, were able to synthesize that into their new system. So then, you know, if someone else says, hey, listen, I want you to put your information out there and potentially offer that type of opportunity to other people who are curious and learning that, you know, that, that's something you can't say no to. You're like, yes, absolutely. Like, I would love to yeah. um, put my thoughts out there in the same way that, you know, the people who taught me did so that makes a lot of sense um with all these interviews you know we, we mentioned some of the some names already what, what do you think are some of the uh uh the underappreciated interviews you've done on the site because i mean there's so many and so many of them are so fantastic i was wondering if you had any specific ones that you kind of look back and are like man people should really go back in the archives and check you know this one out mm -hmm. well that's a, yeah that's a good question i mean probably my favorite one of all time was doing um uh, I had Shirley Sarman and Greg Cook on at the same time. Yeah, that one's great. And, um, you know, even though they, you know, they'll, they'll probably behind the scenes disagree with each other a bit. I mean, Gray, I think he was more excited to even be on the phone with her than I was. But, uh, you know, just to, just to hear the little back and forth between those two and realize, again, they're all coming from the same place and they're all trying to get to the same place in the end. They just have different ways of getting there. And, um, you know, I don't think you can go wrong using either one of their their techniques uh, or their systems it's just you know, again it's a grace that stuff fits me a little bit better and working with more of the athletes but um you know that was just that was a fun thing to be a part of was talking with them and um i mean i guess one of the fun things some of the interviews too some of them obviously big name guys um you know you got Stu mcgill and craig levinson and we got um you know, some of these big name guys, but sometimes it's the, it's the guys that nobody's heard of yet that are kind of the fun ones because they're more probably doing what I'm doing. And most of the people that are listening, they're all in the same boat. You know, it's so like when I talk to guys like you or other guys that are doing some cool things and they're, but they own their own practice and they're kind of, you know, trying to find their way too. you know, that's nice because, you know, like I said, I think a lot of us feel like, Hey, we're in the same boat and we're trying to figure this out at the same time. So a lot of those have been great too. I don't know if I could name, you know, specific ones in particular, but, uh, but yeah, I, I like those ones too. Sure. No, I, I, I like what you said too about, you know, there's, uh, on the, on the gray and Shirley call, right. There's, there's disagreements there. Um, but there's a lot of agreement as well. Right. And it's a lot of people saying oh, similar, yeah. similar things in different ways. Um, and then, you know, the, the sort of disagreements are, are learning opportunities. And especially when you get people like that who have a good attitude and want to learn, um, it can be awesome, right? And it's, you know, maybe more destructive when you have people who think they're a guru and are fighting for market share and all that type of stuff. But, um, you know, really good stuff when people uh, disagree, but, you know, agree that the other person also has good intentions and is trying to, to figure things out the same way um, that, that they are. And, and actually, speaking of uh, of Shirley's course, it was funny, right? She's uh, have you taken any of her courses? What's that? Have you taken any of Shirley's courses? I have. I you know I actually have not. I've read her books and I've talked, interviewed her a couple of different times. I've never actually taken one of her courses. Yeah, she's uh, she's super super funny, right? So she's always yeah. telling jokes and uh, kind of like throwing barbs out at people. So you know she'd do something, and she'd be like, "Oh, and this is like my new myofascial technique. Like you got to check out my course coming out next week, right?" Like kind of poking fun at the uh, the continuing education industry. And yeah. So so she threw a few of those out, and like everyone kind of laughs. And then she she sort of said the same thing, where she's like, "Honestly, like I'm joking around." Like, I think some of the stuff is ridiculous, but you know, in reality, most people selling this stuff agree with each other and we just all need to sort of figure out, um, what are the commonalities between everyone rather than sort of, um, why are we going to fight over, is it fascia versus, you know, muscle versus nervous system versus, um, corrective exercise and you know, all this type of stuff. So, um, right. I thought, I thought that was super funny. Um, yeah. with, the, uh, well, and, and one of the, one of the things I'll just mention real quick, what, what Shirley and Gray did agree upon was that, I mean, you've got to do pre and post testing on these people, whether it's, it's an athlete in a, in a strength and conditioning setting or it's, it's your patients. I mean, again, they have two very different ways of doing things a lot of times, but if they, they come to the same outcome, 
you know, you wanted to improve their hip mobility, you know, did whatever technique you used, did it get what you wanted to, yes or no? And, um, you know, that was one thing they both agreed upon. They both get great outcomes, you know, and they measure them constantly to know that they're doing, they're in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, getting what they want, you know, out of it. So, you know, who's to say, you know, if they're both getting great outcomes, who's right or who's wrong? They're both right. For sure. No, that, that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then with, with sports rehab expert and having a practice, um, what have you sort of, as far as business wise, is, are there lessons that you learn from sports rehab expert that have helped you, you know, retain clients or bring new clients into your practice or potentially vice versa with, um, you know, getting memberships on the site and, and getting good interviews. Is there, is there anything that's kind of translated back and forth between those two for you? Well, I mean, I, for the most part, I try to keep them fairly separate, but I don't, I don't think you can help, you know, talking to, you know, so many people that are way smarter than me all the time and not, you know, absorbing some of that information. And, you know, they give me so many great ideas and, you know, or I go take their courses and bring, bring those things back. And I think it just, you know, I, it's for the same reasons you go take these courses. I mean, you want to be the best you can be. But it gives you an advantage, too, when people come in to see you and, you know, hey, you've got all these different, you know, I hate this kind of a cliche, but, you know, you have all these different tools in your toolbox. But, you know, you've got so many solutions to help fix these problems for these people and help them meet, re, meet their goals. You know, so many uh, solutions that other people don't have. And, uh, you know, over time, I think that just does, you can market it yourself that way or you can just do it and, you um, you know, your clients will know it and they'll tell their friends and then their friends will be in to see it too. So, you know, I think that's been the biggest benefit is just what I've learned from talking to so many and so many smart people over the years and just hopefully I've learned a few things and uh, it's made me a better PT and a better coach. Sure. Um, and I guess related to that, cause this is a challenge that, um, I know I experienced trying to grow a fitness business in Chicago and then also, uh, trying to refer people out, you know, since a lot of times I'll say, Hey, listen, you know what? Like there's something up with your shoulder. I can give you some ideas on things to do, but like you need to go see someone who can actually handle this for you, right? Whose job it is to handle this. And I know I experience. uh, I guess challenge is trying to get people to potentially go see someone different than who they've seen or getting buy-in as far as that process goes. Since I think that a lot of uh, potential customers or clients are uneducated and they can't tell the difference between, you know, sort of a standard run of the mill PT or chiropractor versus someone who has this broad base of knowledge. They don't know what's possible in terms of like, I like for me, I'll be like, listen, I don't want to step on the toes of your practitioner, but like, what that guy is telling you makes no sense to me. And I think you need a second opinion. How do you sort of try to, uh, I guess, educate people or make it clear that there, there is a differentiation in that, that value that you can provide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the most important things you can do just, I mean, kind of preemptively too, is to create a team where, you know, if you've got, you know, you, you know, some good PTs, chiropractors, um, you know, that you can refer people out to, um, you know, just so they're not going off the, you know, someone they have, who's not going to know what you're doing either. Cause that's, that's the thing. I mean, I want someone else to know, um, you know, if I could tell them, Hey, this is kind of where we finished up. This was their function movement screen score. And now, you know, they're going to go train with you full time, you know, Hey, they can look at that and understand what we were doing. And then, you know, they can take this person and be successful long term. So I think having a team, you know, is going to be helpful for that. So you can kind of send people where you need them to go. Um, Tough part for me a lot of times I work with a lot of physicians and even surgeons and uh, they have no clue. Um, a lot of times, I mean, you should read some of these protocols these surgeons come up with. They're quite amusing. Um, they have no clue what we do, you know, and, uh, you know, they give someone a one pound lifting limit. You know, there's not a whole lot. And they want you to do uh, three times a week for six weeks. You know, there's not a whole lot you can do with that. So. I have to go out and do a lot of education with the physicians in my area, with the surgeons, you know, people like that and try to hopefully get them to see, you know, where I'm coming from too. Give someone else. So, you know, I get my rotator cuff patient with the one pound limit, but I'll go to the doc and I've shown a lot of them what farmers carries look like suitcase carries. We do a lot of kettlebell deadlifts. Oh, their arms down by their side when they're doing that. Oh, that's fine. No, go ahead. Uh, you know, maybe go ahead and they can have 25 pounds in that hand, you know, versus before I would have been stuck with, you know, can't do much of anything. You know, they just don't want them to take it up and over. 
So if I can go educate them, I can get away with having them do a lot of things that other people aren't going to get to do. And, you know, the athletes find that out after a while, which obviously helps me. The docs, well, hey, you know, this guy, he does this with all these athletes, go see him. So it's only going to come back to benefit you in the end to try to get these people on the same page with you. And, um, you know, it doesn't, not every single time is it going to work, especially when you're dealing with surgeons. They, you know, they're always right. Um, so sometimes you do have to have that conversation of like, look, you are just going to have to wait. And this is going to take time and, uh, you know, and do the best you can. Sure. Yeah. So for you, it's, it's not just a matter of, uh, educating potential clients, but also the people who are referring them in terms of the doctors yes. or the strength coaches. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense, especially since for you, I'm not sure what the licensing requirements are in Michigan, but I imagine most of your people are coming to you with a script. So they're being referred by a physician. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. But, probably most people we get. Um, nowadays, you know, we have direct access now, finally. So people will find us and just come straight to us, but we still have to get the doctors okay. Um, to see them in the end. And if they're post-surgical, we always have to have a script. So. Sure. Yeah. So, and, and like you mentioned, sometimes it can be challenging to take someone from another profession and educate them on your profession, right? Because they're trying to keep up with, well, I'm concerned with, I'm doing X number of surgeries per week and I want to make sure that I'm performing the surgeries to the best of my ability. And like, I don't want to learn about rehab and physical therapy. I want to learn about surgery. So that's a, that's a challenge for you in terms of uh, being able to have that communication. But it sounds like it's worth it if you're able to kind of bridge that gap. Yeah. I and mean, they, they just want to know that, hey, their person's going to be safe to go. And this works for training environments too, but they, they want to know that that person's safe. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna protect that shoulder. You're going to get their motion better. You're going to get them stronger. You know, because that outcome eventually comes going to come back on the surgeon too. And I've heard, you know, some of the docs say the same thing about, man, I'm worried about, you know, them going to this gym because, you know, I have a lot of people from this gym that come to me with, uh, you know, shoulder injuries or knee injuries. You know, so they even want to be confident about who they're dealing with, you know, looking out long term a lot of times. So, you know, it is. It's something they don't want to have to think about. So if you can kind of show them, hey, this is what I do. It's very safe, you know, but at the same time, we can, you know, we can really get them moving well and get them strong, you know, but we're protecting what the work that you did, you know, they're going to, they remember that kind of stuff. They, they like easy. And if they know you do a good job, they're going to send people to you because, yeah, they don't want to have to think about that kind of thing. They just want to do surgery. Sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Joe, where can people find out more about Sports Rehab Expert and uh, where, where can people look you up if they, uh, if they want to get treatment from you in Michigan? Sure. Um, the website is just sportsrehabexpert.com, so they can find that online, or my email is sportsrehabexpert at gmail.com uh, if they've got questions. If people want to check out the site, um, on the left-hand side, I think it's about the fifth choice down, it says sample articles. So there's a free page with, there's some interviews, there's probably even a couple webinars on there, and uh, you know lots of articles, things like that, that we've done in the past. And then, you know, it's it's a dollar to try it out for 14 days. That's plenty of time to get on there and, and look around and see if it's if it's right for you. Um, for the uh, physical therapy clinic up here, uh, it's Elite Physical Therapy and Sports Performance. Uh, that's our, our website is uh, www.eliteptc.com. And again, I got a blog on there too. Write some articles that it's probably a little less for the PT crowd. It's probably more for, you know, patients and clients. And, uh, yeah, like with our, you know, I don't mind if, uh, you know, people get on and kind of swipe some of those ideas either, you know, do some exercise of the week type things and just try to get some decent info out there for patients. And, um, but yeah, you can find me through either one of those two. Awesome, man. Thanks for coming on. And, uh, this has been great and very enlightening, and I think that there's you know a lot of carryover between what you do as a therapist um, and what a lot of strength coaches are doing, and then just you know some of the back end business stuff is fascinating too because whether or not you run your own business or um, have ambitions to do that, or if you're just a coach or or, uh, or an athlete, there's a lot of lessons to be learned in terms of you know how do I balance my time, how do I uh, integrate these different ideas, how do I figure out you know how to get big wins and all that stuff. So this has been uh, this has been fantastic. Thanks for your time, man. Yeah, no, hey, thanks a bunch for having me on. Like I said, it's kind of fun to be on the opposite side of things every once in a while. So, yeah, thanks for having me on.